Uh, I'd like to uh, present to you today on the topic of data analytics and to present it in a unique perspective, which is in its social context. Uh, I'm presenting today under the capacity as a active data analytics consultant, as a practicing academic researcher, <laughs> as a lifelong computer geek, which is someone who's been working with computers and data for more than 30 years. And finally, being this venue as it is, as somewhat of a futurist, which is to give you an idea of the long-term trends associated with big data and data analytics. And for some reason, I got it in my head that a futurist needs to have a pipe. So <laughs> in order to prepare for my talk, of course, I took it upon myself. And I found it's very useful for simulating deep thoughts and making wildly irresponsible generalizations about the future, and also making particular rhetorical points, which is don't believe the pipe. Now, the message here really is that there is some level of hype associated with big data and data analytics. And I think the danger is we have this tendency to have these utopian dreams about new technologies and new event, uh, innovations. And these often come crashing down. And then we leave dejected and depressed. In fact, the IT research firm Gartner has even codified this as the technology hype curve, which is that each new technology suddenly is built up into a hype and uh, afterwards it doesn't deliver on the promises, so people walk away. But this is often the platform for people then to realize what is truly valuable about that innovation. And I think that's what I'd like uh, and hope I can deliver to you today is an idea of what is truly valuable for data analytics and in particular because I strongly believe that if we can really substantiate what is valuable, we'll hit higher levels of development with the use of data analytics to help us make better decisions. So uh, what exactly is data analytics? Well, commonly it's framed in three capacities, which is descriptive analytics, which is typically associated with business intelligence. We have predictive analytics, which is typically associated with econometrics and data forecasting for financials. And this uh, allows us to identify trends and probabilities in the future. And finally, prescriptive analytics, which comes to us from the field of operations research, which helps us to make systems more efficient and more sustainable. So supporting this, of course, is big computing, big uh, data, big sets of data. And they are applied to big challenges. And it's appropriate to say as well that supporting this, we have a combination of technology, systems, and people. And in the case of data analytics, this is data engineering, the process of data analysis, and most importantly, the decision making that goes on, which is as fancy as our computers are. Ultimately, we need to make the decisions that come out of that analysis. So if we look at the skill set associated with a typical data scientist, we of course have computer science, we have statistics, but, and I think which is not often represented enough, some understanding of the scientific method. Now this complicates things because increasingly data analytics is being dragged into the commercial sphere to drive businesses. However, as was brought up in a recent cover story article in The Economist, we can see that science often has enough trouble doing science itself. Uh, in particular, they brought out how often the career incentives in the career path of a scientist are not often aligned with good research. And so when we bring science into the commercial sphere, we can expect even more problems. And indeed, this article also pointed out that we have some behavioral cognitive issues that predispose us to making often poor decisions. So an example would be we often see phantom patterns in complex sets of information. We also, at times, will uh, attribute unnatural explanations to a coincidental conjunction of phenomenon. And as well, we often will be boundedly rational, which is we may see something purely in the context of information surrounding it, such as in this case, where we have two orange dots that are completely the same size, yet we can't help but have the feeling that one is larger than the other. Now, this all comes about uh, due to our primitive uh, evolution from coming out of very harsh natural environments, surviving in the wild, finding food, fending off predators and each other at times. In which case, we are, as the economic Nobel Prize winning uh, experimental psychologist Daniel Kahneman expressed it, we were built to win, not necessarily to be right, which is we didn't evolve necessarily to be scientists. That takes work. Now, 
Sometimes when we collaborate with each other, we can do away with some of these cognitive biases. However, there are times when these biases get amplified, such as when we look at market bubbles. A very topical example being here in the Netherlands as of the financial bubble that occurred with the Dutch tulip craze in the 1600s. Now, in the medieval times, being a very uh, random and superstitious time, people had a uh, comfort with nature, often being very fickle and dangerous. So they had this concept of the wheel of fortune. That th sometimes things go up, sometimes they go down. Arguably, uh, our own belief in scientism and technology and the force of engineering can sometimes mislead us, as we saw very recently when we were afflicted by a very big financial bubble that we're still recovering from. And data analytics, I have to say, played a strong role in this, which is we had some of the best minds on the planet working in investment banking and banking and passing on these securities and using elaborate data analysis to justify what turned out to be a broken system due to poor and perverse incentives. Well, Let's go into a little more detail about the problems that can occur with data analytics when we apply large data sets and computer analysis to our decision making. So one example is overfitting, which is when we have a sample and we place too much significance on that sample. So an example here is of uh, the US military wanted to identify a particular tank in the field. It had several examples of that tank. It lined them up in a row in a field, took pictures of them, fed them into a computer, into an algorithm called a neural network. And the computer built a model then of what it understood to be that type of tank. Subsequently, they started feeding in intelligence photos from around the world. Initially, it seemed to be doing very well. They started identifying all these tanks, and then they said, well, wait a minute, these tanks are all over the world. And indeed, uh, what the computer had decided was that any tank that had a particular shadow of this length was that tank. It had done its job, which is these pictures were taken all at the same time in the same field at a certain latitude, and the computer said, oh, uh, these tanks all have this length of shadow. So this is a classical example of overfitting, how our own uh, poor choices and sampling can mislead our computers and then uh, misadvise us. So another uh, error that can occur is what's called correlation versus causation. Now, the uh, a good example of this is, well, the rooster crows every time the sun rises. So therefore, uh, the rooster causes the sun to rise, obviously, and we must therefore worship the rooster because the rooster is magical and sustains life. Now, this can also occur in data analysis. So this is meant to be a, satir a satirical example, but here we propose that the decline in piracy correlates very strongly with the rise in global temperature. So there is a very simple explanation. We need less and less pirates to, uh, we need more pirates actually to <laughs> cause uh, global temperatures to decline. In fact, perhaps someone believes this because we've seen a resurgence in piracy in the last 10 years. So we'll see how this experiment goes. So now finally we come to what's called the big data approach. Now this is the idea that uh, since we have so much data and hundreds of variables, we don't necessarily need to worry about uh, causation and we don't need to worry about our sample size. We have all the data. We are powerful, almighty. Now a good example of this is the Google flu trends, which is Google found that uh, about 45 key search terms correlated with subsequent outbreaks in geographic regions of the flu before they were reported to doctors in the centers for disease control. So it had a lot of predictive power. However, subsequently, and the Google team then reported on this, uh, with the H1N1 uh, virus outbreak, there was a lot of media attention and suddenly all the hypochondriacs and everyone worried about catching this horrible virus suddenly went on searching uh, madly. And as a result, then Google flu trends overreported outbreaks of the flu. And they subsequently reported a paper on this and modified their model. And that's exactly what we need to do. That's good science. That's uh, revising our model as uh, conditions change in the future. <clears throat> so uh, the, the point is, is that we should uh, use the model and that should drive uh, the data, not vice versa, that we should not place um, a blind trust in big sets of data. More than this, <laughs> models essentially are all wrong, which is their representations of reality. And as an abstraction, they're choosing to emphasize certain things and to de-emphasize others. So the quote is that all models are wrong, but some are useful. 
And the example here is of the, uh, the geocentric uh, Ptolemaic view of the solar system, which it has a lot of predictive power. It can predict the seasons. Um, we can predict the movement of the stars. It just happened to be completely wrong, such that if we happened to send some people to the moon, they would fly off into space. Because the, uh, the fundamental physical reality underneath the model was uh, completely different, as we found out. So this goes back to the origins of science. And so a seminal work by the uh, anthropologist Sir James Frazier, The Golden Bough, he links our primitive uh, religions and superstitions to the desire to do science, which is a lot of primitive superstitions and magical beliefs attempt to model the world. They attempt to create some sort of representation of causation or a phenomenon that resemble one another. It just happens that magic and superstition don't have a repeatable process for validating that knowledge socially amongst each other. So it can tend to deify or create a model that turns out to be completely wrong. So essentially, what we need to do then is we need better processes to ensure that we're doing good science. So in order to introduce that, I propose the riddle. When is a fence a wall? The fence being something that is not completely blocking our imagination or blocking our creativity, but yet allows us to uh, keep within a certain range and not go off into superstition and magical belief systems. So there's a few answers to this, which is one is we can simply put a sign on our fence and say, don't go beyond this fence. And this might be considered rigor in science, which is we have certain rules about how we conduct science and how we conduct research. We cannot, but we also have to recognize that people are often very naughty. They go around the fence or ignore the fence. So in this case, we need our models to be adaptable, that we need models that can flex uh, with new information and with people misbehaving. Well, we can also set up a series of fences, and this is the idea of having reproducibility, which is many people can repeat an experiment or a study and validate that these results were accurate. Finally, and very importantly, uh, we can approach the fence from, a si from the side, which is if we throw something at the fence from the front, it's likely to go right through. But if we approach it from the side, we're actually likely to hit one of the protective slats here. And the idea here, here is of falsifiability. Now, what this means is essentially, we don't try to have all-encompassing final models or theories, but we admit that any theory or model we propose is only true for certain circumstances, and it's proven not to be not true until it gets attacked and revised by more, and, uh, more experiments and additional testing. And so this is what the great philosopher of science, Karl Popper, called uh, falsifiability and associated it with a certain heroism of the scientist. And in order for us to have good science, whether that be in a commercial sphere or in the research framework, we need to have people who are not driven to, to prove final and exhaustive theories, but are striving to have uh, their theories attacked, and in fact, to invite those attacks, to invite that people will criticize uh, their theories and to stimulate debate. And careers are not always aligned with this concept of falsifiability. If you're very humble and say, oh, my theory only works in this certain circumstance with this data, and please attack it, it's probably wrong. That's exactly, essentially, what needs to happen. And that's really where, what we need to do when we're conducting and, and trying to conduct data science. So again, knowledge is created in a social framework, which is we share knowledge, we validate it amongst each other. So it's a social process. We've come very far, which is we've come out of the primordial jungle, we've built complex societies. Indeed, we've achieved uh, stupendous heights and uh, achieved technological and engineering progress. We've also created large problems for, for ourselves, which is the overgrowth of humanity and environmental degradation are plaguing us, and these are very large problems. I do feel that data analytics, if properly applied, can help to solve some of these problems provided that we conduct them with uh, the good science in mind. But according to what I've said today, I'd like to propose, in terms of the future of analytics, that we need to amplify uh, the frames that we pursue analytics within. And by that, I mean we need better diagnostics and we need better semantic analysis. So what are these? Well, basically, Diagnostics is just what I've talked to you today. It's uh, using proper statistical tests and procedures to assure that our models are sound, to give us some sense of validity, 
and we need to have the capacity for semantic analytics, and that is finding ways to better to describe to our computers the meaning and content of what we're trying to achieve. So uh, behind this is what's called the semantic web. Now, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, who is the originator of HTML, has been promoting this, and I think it is actually going to be a huge change in the way that we interact with computers in the future, which is semantic analytics lets us describe to computers the meaning and context for the things that we're trying to convey and study within the computer. So what we'll see if we're able to improve our diagnostics with analytics and working with computers, and we're able to improve our semantic context, is we'll see tighter integration of decision-making with computers in organizations. And finally, we will see the ability of computers to guide us in the knowledge creation process, and even autonomously to identify new knowledge. And this is already happening. It's already started. So again, this all occurs within a social network, and that's perhaps the best message I can leave you with today, is we should not become so focused on our engineering and our technology that we forget that knowledge creation is a social process. It has to have a semantic framework, and it has to be uh, rigorously validated through diagnostics. So as Karl Popper said, at the, to the core of our being, we're all human. The message here is do not fall in love with data. And well, with that, I thank you for your time today and somewhat of a complicated subject, and I hope I've been able to convey a very broad concept uh, uh, quickly and uh, it wasn't too painful. And ah, yes, with my pipe, I bid you adieu. <laughs>